All right. So, no no comedy for today, it appears. All right. So, 822 is the ideal Rankin cycle. So, uh, last time, I know it's been a long time, but last time we talked about just the basic ranking cycle and power generation in general, right? Like coal power, nuclear, all that stuff. Um, so now we're getting into the ideal ranking cycle, which is what, so this is what you'll be tested on, on the final, not, so it might not be ideal, but it will be a ranking cycle for sure. Right? So this, this right here is still important. You still have, and this is the basis for the whole next class, Thermo 2. So, probably be wise to pay attention here. So it says, uh, da, da, da. it says, if this working fluid passes through various components of the simple vapor power cycle without irreversibilities, frictional pressure drops would be absent from the boiler and condenser. And the working fluid would flow through these components at constant pressure. Also, in the absence of irreversibilities and heat transfer with the surroundings, the process through the turbine and pump would be isentropic. A cycle adhering to these idealizations is the ideal Rankine cycle. So essentially what this means is, is that um, through the pump, which is right here, is uh, isentropic because there's no heat transfer loss, no frictional losses. Uh, S1 is equal to S, or S3 is equal to S4, as you guys can see from the straight up and down there, right? Same thing with the boiler. They're saying that no heat transfer is leaving it, uh, right? Or through the turbine, sorry. No heat transfer is leaving it. Uh, and uh, the friction losses through the turbine are none, right? So S1 is equal to S2. Hopefully a better line than that. So S1, S2. Okay. So we're going to go through this uh, really fast. So it says, referring to figure 8.3, which is right here. Uh, we see that the working fluid undergoes the following series of internally re reversible processes. So process one to two is isentropic expansion of the working fluid through the turbine from saturated vapor at state one to the condenser pressure. So this is uh, just showing, so state one could be up here too, like it, but we're, we're showing you just state one right here. So uh, this is probably the actual cycle. This is a, uh, I think like maybe nah, not the Carno version, but it's something else. So we go from one to two isentropic expansion. We had high pressure, high temperature. We expand it through the turbine, made a bunch of power. Uh, and then we are uh, now down here somewhere in the saturated region, right? We've lost a lot of pressure. Pressure one here is high pressure. Pressure two and three, low pressure. Condenser pressure is usually atmospheric or maybe even less. Probably less, actually. Yeah, now that I think about it, probably less. So, then we have two to three. Heat transfer from the working fluid as it flows at constant pressure through the condenser with saturated liquid. So, right here, between two and three, this state right here, this is heat leaving the cycle. If you guys remember how this is divvied up, uh, this is heat in, right? All of this. Heat leaving, and the middle part here is the work right here. Remember, this is work. The whole thing is heat. So, essentially, what this is is that 2 to 3 is just trying to lose heat. That is all we are trying to do is we are trying to throw the heat out of the cycle to get it to be saturated uh, vapor, or saturated liquid, sorry. We're trying to go from 2 to 3, from whatever liquid and vapor we have now, to zero, all liquid. And the reason is, is because we're trying to go through the pump. Pumps are for liquid only. Having a large amount, I mean, I'm sure you guys have like, uh, uh, have any of you ever guys used a sump pump in your life? At some point. So essentially, uh, I'll, yeah, so essentially what happens is that you put this pump into water. Have you ever heard it when it starts sucking in air? Yeah, it doesn't t it doesn't work. It also starts to overheat as well. So pumps we want for water or any liquid, and so that's why we have to get rid of all of the vapor before we can run it through the pump, which is from states three to four. This is what keeps the cycle working, right? So now a little bit is probably expected, right? Like there's there's a little bit expected here, I'm sure. Like maybe a little bit of vapor, maybe in some of these states, but like. Generally speaking, like we're we're expecting all of it to be gone, and they probably make sure that it is. 
within a certain region or within a certain margin. So then we have process three to four, isentropic compression from pump to state four in the compressed liquid region. So from state three here to state four is compression. So you guys know obviously what the pump is doing. The pump is just trying to get, uh, they're trying to get from low pressure here and we're trying to get it back up to where it went into the boiler at, right? Because we want this cycle to be a cycle, right? It has to go in the same as it's coming in, right? It has to leave the boiler the same uh, every time. And so we're trying to get it back up to the original state so it can continue around, right? And so that's what the pump's there to do. And so the pump's just going to pump it through the cycle and get it back to where it needs to be. So um, then the last one is heat transfer to the working fluid as it flows constant pressure through the boiler. So the boiler is in between these states right here. It is this whole line. So essentially what happens is we have a subcooled liquid here at some low temperature, right? And lower pressure I get, or well now it's on the higher pressure line, but um, low temperature here. And we are just essentially combusting a bunch of stuff inside of a boiler. And there are these little tubes that run through it, right? And the little tubes are where the working fluid is and it's just going to heat up. Essentially, it's just a heat transfer process. Uh, states two to three and four to one are very similar. Two to three and one to four are just heat transfer processes where we're trying to either lose heat or gain heat. So right here, we are burning stuff up, right? To get uh, from one to four or four to one. Down here, we are in heat transfer with a uh, reservoir, some hot water reservoir or not hot water, cold water reservoir or a cooling tower, I guess. So it says, uh, the ideal Rankine cycle also includes the possibility of superheating vapor. So this one right here is the actual cycle. So this one right here, this was like a basic version of it. The outside version, the ones with primes, this is how the cycle actually looks. Uh, I don't think I know of any cycles that run at saturated vapor going into the turbine. Uh, most of them superheat it. I would, say, I would say all of them. I would be surprised to say that there wasn't anyone that did it. So this is what it will actually look like. It will really look like this. Right. So that is the real cycle. It, it goes into the superheated region. So it says, uh, and it says the importance of superheating is discussed in a further section, 8.3. Uh, since the ideal rank itself consists of internally reversible processes, areas under the process lines of figure 8.3 can be interpreted as heat transfers per unit mass of flowing. Apply equation 6.9, area 1 BC 4A represents the heat transfer to the working fluid passing through the boiler. So once again, they're talking about how you can divvy this up. Uh, you can break this hole down. The area under it becomes this whole area right here from all the way up like this. That whole area is heat going into the cycle. This part is heat leaving and the middle part, the difference is the uh, work, right? Because if you guys recall, work has to be equal to, if you put in, let's say, you put in a million uh, into the boiler and you lose th you know, uh, 300,000 down here, the work, the maximum amount of work you could possibly get would be the difference, right? Now, obviously, we know that there are, this is only for an idealized version of the cycle. Uh, the real cycle, the one that has uh, inefficiency, those are obviously going to have less than that. But you see that's the maximum you can achieve, right? Because we didn't just, you know, you can't just find energy in here, right? We didn't just pick it up. It had to come from somewhere, and it came from the boiler. All right. So this right here is uh, a very important part. So we're going to move to this right here. So this right here is uh, extremely important for how you're going to solve through pumps uh, in this uh, class and the next one. So it says, because the pump is idealized as operating without irreversibilities, equation 651B can be invoked as an alternative for evaluating pump work. Right here is something I mentioned last time. I know it's been quite a while, but I'll forgive you for not remembering. But this right here is the perfect pump equation. So 
The reason why this is important is because, if you guys remember, how you solve through everything, such as a turbine, a compressor, and a pump, you always solve through them first isentropically, right? For the most part, I would say 95 or 98% of cases, it's, it's, you solve isentropically first, you say S1 is equal to S2. This equation is that, it is S1 is equal to S2, it's a perfect pump. So this is how you will solve it just about every time. So, it says, um, so this equation right here, and it says uh, the subscript uh, internally reversible signals that this is an expression is restricted only to a reversible process. Um, and it says evaluation of the integral of this equation right here requires a relationship between the specific volume and the pressure. So you have to know how it moves between each of them. Because the specific volume of the liquid normally varies only slightly as liquid flows from the inlet to the uh, exit to the pump, a plausible approximation to the value can be uh, of the integral can be taken, or can be had by taking the specific volume at pump inlet V3 as constant. So what they are saying is the following: They're saying uh, because you guys remember doing this right here, these integrals at the very beginning of the class, you had to know the path, right? You had to know the states, and so. This one, they just said, ah, well, V is constant, right? So you can pull it out. And the reason why we can say that is because we went from saturated liquid to a subcooled sub liquid. And uh, if you look at the tables, uh, you'll tend to see that uh, these things don't change very much. They're very much the same going in as they are going uh, out. So, like, I mean, you can just look at this, right? very small differences between all of these. So they just assume that V3 is equal to a V4 for simplicity, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't make a huge bit of difference. So what you end up with is this right here. This is the work of the pump per mass is equal to V3 times P4 minus P3. And now you might be wondering how this helps us, right? Well, it helps us in the following way. It helps us uh, work of the pump can then be changed with H4S minus H3, and minus, not equals, we'll get to that, minus H3, because the work of the pump, as you guys might know, is just the difference in enthalpy, right? So H4S minus H3, I'm gonna write this out a little bit better. So H4S minus H3, because remember, the perfect pump uh, means that it's H4S, and then it is equal to V3 times P4, minus P3. And the reason why this helps us is because we would have already known H3 because it was the previous state, right? So you can add this to the other side. And you end up with H4S is equal to all that stuff, right? This stuff. And how this helps is because if we know the isentropic efficiency of the pump, uh, let's say it's, you know, 0.8, right? You now have this equation which is the efficiency of the pump, right? If you guys remember, we did turbine ones. This is the efficiency of the pump equation. And so since we just solved for that, you can solve for the actual value, which is H4. So that's the reason why this is so important is because I've seen so many people get to this point in the cycle and they don't know what to do. They completely forgot about this perfect pump. They have, they don't, under, they don't understand what happened. So please, make note that the perfect pump equation is this right here. I will write it out in full this time. So I will say it is H4S is equal to H3 plus V3, little or little V3, specific volume, times P4 minus uh, P3. And really fast, for SI units, SI units right here, uh, make this kilopascals. If you make this kilopascals, the units end up working out uh, to where H4S is correct in the end. If you have this in any other unit, it will not come out correct. H4S will end up being massive or it wouldn't look like it changed at all. So this needs to be... But I mean, obviously you guys can, you guys can still, you know, you can multiply by the right numbers and still get the right answer. But I'm just telling you, please make sure that if using SI, you change to kilopascals. Uh, for English units, uh, I think you have to do, uh, what is it? I think it's one, I think you have to, 
do uh, 144 over 778, which is changing it to um, it's changing it to feet squared, right? Because this is pounds per square inch. It's changing it to feet squared, and then you're dividing by that BTU conversion, and I think that is how you convert that one. But we'll see here in a little bit when we might do a question about it. But please remember that equation. We'll do it. We're going to actually do a whole cycle very, very soon. Okay. So this right here is the ideal Rankine cycle. So here it goes. We are actually going to do it now. So let's pull up in a paint. Everyone's favorite. And let's go with uh, 2,500. Sure. So give me a second to bring it in here. So bring that over. And I'm also going to bring in the uh, picture as well because I think the picture is helpful. So I will not bring in that because we are going to talk about that. So right here. All right, so now we are ready to roll. So we have, let's get rid of this stuff, get it out of my way. So we have the steam uh, is the working fluid in an ideal ranking cycle. Saturated vapor enters the turbine. So really fast before we, before we keep going, or I keep going, um, one thing to note is that <clears throat> For these questions, uh, the further you get into the semester of Thermo 2, the longer they become. Like they, they throw a bunch of things at you really fast, and you have to be able to pick out what is the information you're looking for. So I'm going to uh, start a little text box right here for Givens because uh, you're going. It, it does take some time to get used to how uh, the information flows at you. So Givens. So let's start. It says uh, steam is the working fluid, so let's write that down. Steam, and it says in an ideal Rankine cycle. So when it says ideal, what that means is is that the whole cycle is isentropic, right? Uh, all the okay. How about all the components are isentropic, being pumps and turbines and compressors. That means they're isentropic. Uh, processes. Uh, one to two and three to four. That is what it means. So let's do this. Then it says, uh, saturated vapor enters the turbine. So what they have given you was, they've given you X1 is equal to uh, one. So the quality at state one is one, right? And then they've given us pressure one is equal to eight megapascals, but not only pressure one, what else did they give us there? It is also pressure what? Anybody? Anybody alive out there? Seemingly not. Okay, so pressure four is pressure also pressure one. Because it's after the pump. So next one, it says uh and saturated liquid exits the condenser. So what they have given us there was the quality of three is equal to zero. So now this is, a, I'm going to move this down really fast. So what I am doing is essentially just looking this. So this is state one right here, going into the turb going to the turbine. State two is here. State three is after the cool condenser and state four is after the pump. So, <clears throat> You just need to know how it is numbered. Pressure one and four over here, two and three down here. And it says after the condenser. So after the condenser, we are at pressure of um, 0 0.008 megapascal. So that's one more thing I have to put down here. So we have pressure three, or pressure two, which is equal to pressure three, which is equal to 0 0.008, yeah, 0 0.008 m. 
SPA. So this is what they have given us. It says, that, oh, the net output, the net uh, work of the cycle is, net power output is 100 uh, megawatts. So let's, forgot about that. So this is work net is equal to 100 megawatts. So it says, determine for the cycle, the thermal efficiency, the back work ratio, the mass flow rate of the steam, and the rate of heat transfer going in, the rate of heat transfer out of the condensing water, it's got a lot of stuff, although most questions don't have all this, but they're just trying to introduce to you all of the things you might have to solve for in one go. But the most important thing is, is that we need to find very quickly the most important part, right, which is how you would solve for these. We need enthalpies, we need entropies, we need all that stuff. So we're going to break this up into the states as usual, right? No change there. So state one, I'm going to try and put them up here. So state one, we were given x1 is equal to 1, p1 is equal to 8 MPA. So that means we were given something in which to go look up, right? So we have x1, quality of 1, which is saturated vapor, and we have pressure 1 as 8 megapascals. So we must go to the tables, right? And remember, it's steam, so we're going to go to the steam tables. So 8 megapascals, uh, which these are in bars, so pretty sure it's 80, right? Uh, it is 80 bar. So we go across here and we grab our saturated vapor value. So our saturated vapor value, let's go down for uh, here. So this is the saturated vapor value for water at 80 bar, which is 2758. So we would go back to our thing here. H1 is equal to two seven five eight now we also need s1 and the reason we need s1 is because we're going to be using that in just a second so go across and s1 is right here which is five seven four thirty two and this is just simply because it is saturated vapor and we already can find that right so s1 uh is let's try and move this up i don't even know what i said five seven four three two got it 5.7432 and this would be in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin and H1 is in just kilojoules per kilogram I forgot to add that all right so these are our first state values the first state is usually really easy because they have to give you something coming out of the uh, uh, boiler now we move on to state two now, what would you call state two? I know it's an ideal cycle, and you can call it state two, but what is this actually? If we did, if we had irreversibilities, what would this? What would state two be called? Let's see if we go O for two for questions today. Seemingly 0 for 2. Everybody's already at home. Everybody, to, they're all done. So, state 2. Hector, I see you. I see you type. Oh, you're, oh my God, dude. Okay, S stop, man. All right, don't stop typing already. Anyway, for, for future watchers of the video, he's driving. So, holy crap. All right. So S1 is equal to S2 is how we'll solve through this because, remember, the question said this is ideal processes. So that means 1 to 2 is isentropic. So S1 is equal to S2. And how we now do this is we now have to go to the second pressure, which is 0 0.008 megapascals. We have to go there, and we have to find our... Uh, our entropy value, where it lies on the table. So let's go look. So it is 0 0.008. So I'm pretty sure it is this right here, uh, 0 0.008 bar. Pretty sure, but I always like to be sure, a little more sure than that. But so I want to be sure. So let's so if we had 0 0.08 bar, 
times 0.1. Yeah, it is. So it is this line right here. So this is our megapath, our 0 0.008 megapascals. So what we need to do now is we need to see if that entropy falls in between these lines, right? Because we have to find what state it's at. It could be, you know, anything. Now, uh, now obviously everyone's going to go, well, it's after the turbine and before the compre or condenser, it's going to be uh, in the saturated region. Well, you're right. Basically every time. I would say, hmm, I don't want to say every time, but there are maybe there's maybe one, but it might be in refrigeration cycles where it's not. But we it is in here. I assure you it is in between these two. Our entropy falls between these two. It is not higher than this, and it's not lower than that. So we have to then use our quality, right? That's our next step. Our next step is to find the quality. So we would say this, SF, S2, SG, right? At 0 .008, or 0 .008 uh, M. PA, okay? So that means we have to find our quality, which X2 would then be equal to S2 minus SF divided by SG minus SF, right? If everybody remembers this equation. So we need to find our quality number. So our quality number, uh, this can be calculated fairly easily. Uh, I will do so right now. So it would be 5.7432, so 5.7432 minus our number of the entropy value, which is 0 0.5926, 0 0.5926, okay. Um, so 0.5926, and then, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm doing something. Uh, and then it's divided by 8.2287 minus 0.5926. And it looks like our quality is going to be 0.675 as a quality. So 0.675675. So 0.675 for our quality. Let me make this a little bigger then because we're running out of room. So then we need to find H2. Now H2 can then be found the same way we, uh, the same equation we just used, except it's flipped around to solve for H2. H2 is then equal to HF plus X2 times HFG, which is the difference between the vapor and the uh, liquid. And so what you will get from that answer is the following. So you will get 173.88 plus 0 0.675 times the difference between them, which is 2403. Point one, and you should get an answer of 1795 as our value. So 1795, uh, 0.93. So that is our answer. This is in kilojoules per kilogram. So we have solved state two. State two is done. Uh, we have the entropy for it, and we have the enthalpy for it. Now, if this were an isen, if this were not isentropic you would have to take this H2, which would then be H2S, by the way, the isentropic state. You'd have to take H2S here, and you'd have to plug it into the other equation for the turbine efficiency in order for you to f solve the actual value. So, But for now, uh, we don't have to. So now we have one more, th we have a couple more states to do, T uh, two more. So let's write it up here. So this will be state three. So state three, eh, let's get it right there. So state three, it said that uh, this is coming out of the condenser now. So we, we have solved this state and this state, one before the turbine, one after. We now have to solve the one after the condenser. So what do we know about the condenser? Well, we know that X3 is equal to zero because it's a condenser, right? The job of the condenser is to just remove all of the heat uh, until it gets to saturated liquid. So we know that leaving the condenser will always be saturated liquid. So let's say that. At least in this cycle, it will always be. So X3 is equal to zero. And we also know that the pressure three is equal to 0 0.008 bar, or MPA, sorry. 
So the, what we can get here is that we can go to the table and we can just look them up like we did the first state where we had the pressure and we had the quality. So what we'll do is we'll go back. Go back here. And we need to grab this value right here. 173.88. So 173.88 is equal to H3. And once again, kilojoules per kilogram. Uh, you can grab entropy here, but what I just told you just a minute ago about the perfect pump, get in the habit of when you get to state three, you want to grab specific volume. And that is to solve through the pump in the next stage. So please, please make this a habit. And remember, grabbing the saturated liquid value for it uh, for SI units, you have to put two zeros in front because all of these table listings are 10 to the third. So this is actually 0 0.0010084. So I'm going to write that out. So 0 0.0010084. This right here is our answer in meters cubed per kilogram. Uh, and you can grab S3. Uh, you know, I guess you can. Uh, I don't, though. Generally, I don't even bother because I use the perfect pump equation. So, And you would say F3 is equal to this right here, 0.5926. So we have solved state 3. State 3 is done. Uh, we have the enthalpy, we have the entropy, we have the uh, specific volume. Now we're on to the final stage of our cycle, state four. So because we know these are isentropic processes, and uh, honestly, this is how you'll solve through all of them anyway. So what, what I've done here is how you will solve through every question, except if there is efficiency, you will have to do that extra step to find the actual value. I can't make that clear enough. So we have to use the perfect pump equation. So the perfect pump equation is equal to H4, H3 plus V3 times the change in pressure. So this is the perfect pump equation. Please remember that. H4 is equal to H3 plus V3 times the change in pressure. So if we do that, we move on to the following, where H4 is then equal to our H3 value, which is 173.88, plus our specific volume times the change in pressure. And the change in pressure is going to be in kilopascals for it to work. So what we want is, so this is 8 megapascals to start, right? Which means that this is 8,000, right? So 8,000, and then, uh, what's that table in? And this would be 80, or no, this would be eight, I think. Yeah, it's eight. I'm gonna make sure though, 0 0.08 times 100. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. 0 0.08, which is what that is, times 100. Yeah, okay, I'm right. It's 8. So this is 8. Got to make sure, though. So we have this equation right here. And like I said, if you put it in kilopascals, it'll work out without you having to do anything else, like no multiply by some number. Like, it'll all work out here. So we have 173.88 plus 0 0.0010084 times the change of pressure, which is 8,000 minus 8. And you will find that H4 is equal to 181.94 kilojoules per kilogram. And so what you guys might be wondering is you go, well, wait a minute. Our enthalpy beforehand, or maybe you weren't wondering this, our enthalpy beforehand was 173, and our enthalpy leaving was only 181. That's a very small change, right? That is because... Pumps don't really take a lot, okay, relatively pumps don't take a lot of energy uh, uh, usage. They're rather, they're, in comparison to the cycle, they're not as big. And so essentially these differences in enthalpy, which is equal to the work of the pump, um, are not very high. 
So the pump does not take a whole lot of energy. They're very uh, uh, easy to run. Compressors, on the other hand, much higher. But pumps, a little easier. So we have state four, which is this. Uh, and generally speaking, you don't need anything else for state four. Uh, you don't need the entropy. You can probably find it, uh, but I've never found it because you don't need to. So this right here is what we needed, right? This is all the states solved. Now we need to start solving the question. So we're gonna do these in sort of order. So let's do the solution down here. So this will be solution. So the solution to this question, it said the first one, determine the cycle, the thermal efficiency, the back work ratio, and the mass for it. So let's start with the thermal efficiency. So thermal efficiency, if you guys remember, was, uh, so it's usually eta th, but I'm just gonna put nth, so it's the nth. So this is the efficiency, thermal efficiency of the cycle. So what the thermal efficiency is, it is the work net divided by the heat in. So remember the rules, it is what we want what over what we had to put in to get it, right? So what we want is the work net, right? It's what we, what we are trying to get out of this cycle. It is what we're trying to get to the people living in their houses miles away. So it is 100 megawatts, right? Because the question gave us the uh, net of, uh, power of the cycle right here. Work net is 100 megawatts. But if it didn't give it to you, this would end up being the, uh, it would be the work, or it'd be the work of the turbine minus the work of the pump. And then you'd have to multiply by a mass flow rate, which we do not have yet, but we will sooner or later. So 100 megawatts, but then we need to remember the bottom part here, which is funny that they did this. This it's actually, what's funny is this is uh, out of order. Um, <laughs> you can't do this question in order, which is funny. You have to do it in, uh, you have to do it and uh, get the mass flow rate first. That's funny. Okay. So mass flow rate first, and I'll explain why in just a second. So the reason why we can't do this is because our thermal efficiency is in megawatts, which is a total uh, energy unit. It's not per mass. And if we went and tried to do the boiler, uh, you know, H1 minus H4 is equal to the heat input to the boiler, it'd be in per mass. And the only way to get it not per mass would be by the mass flow rate. And we don't know the mass flow rate yet. And if you wanted to convert the, the megawatts back into the mass, you would have to have the mass flow rate. So it's not possible. They should probably rewrite this question to have you do the mass flow rate first. So it says the mass flow rate of the steam is what we're looking for. So mass flow rate of the steam. So how, anybody have any ideas of how we might find this? I know we don't have much time. We only have 10 minutes, so I'm, I'm going to take just a second. So how we would find this is... So think about it, is that usually when you find a mass, you had to have been given something first. There had to have been something you were given. So what we were given in this question was that we were given 100 megawatts, right, as the network of the cycle. So 100 megawatts has to be equal to what I just told you, which is the work of the turbine minus the work of the pump, which is also equal to this, the mass, yeah, mass times H1 minus H2 minus H4 minus H3. So this is the, uh, this will be mass, mass flow of the cycle times all of this has to be equal to 100 megawatts. Uh, so obviously we can just divide over this whole quantity right here by 100 megawatts and you should get a mass flow rate. Um, Generally, this is how the questions work. They tend to give you something. They tend to give you like the heat in, the heat leaving, the work of the turbine, the work of the pump, something. And generally, when they give you that, I want you guys to immediately go, oh, they gave us the work of the cycle or they gave us the work of the turbine. They need, they want me to find the work of the, or they want me to find the mass flow rate. Immediately, you need to, that needs to signal to you is that, oh, they've given me a lifeline. They've thrown me the you know, the life jacket. This is what they want from you. So you have 100 megawatts divided by the following, which is uh, H1 minus H2, which I'm gonna just put the numbers because I'll do it on my calculator in a second. 2758 
minus H2, which is 1795, or 19, 1795, yeah, sorry, 0.93, minus our other value, which is just the work of the pump, which is not very much. And also, uh, do be careful about doing the work of the pump because uh, if you flip these two numbers around, you'll get a negative number and you'll actually be adding pump work. Make sure that this is how it stays, that this, is a neg this will be a, a positive number and you subtract a positive number. Do need to be careful. I've seen that happen a few times. So we have this as, and this is all equal to, sorry, the mass flow rate. So I'm gonna call it M1. Because this cycle is operating at steady state, uh, the mass flow rate is the same throughout. So it's all equal to M1, and I will just do this right now. So we have 100 divided by, oh, wait a minute. Nope, I gotta change that unit. So let me see. And then let's divide this out. So this is 2758. Sorry, it's really dark in my room. I feel like I'm, you know, in the bat cave or something. Uh, ones, okay. Yes, yeah, it might take a second. So I get 101, so or 104, 104.72. So 104.72, uh, and this would be in uh, kilograms uh, per second, I do believe. So we have kilograms per second there. And then if you wanted to turn this into, as the answer says, in kilograms per hour, you would just multiply by 3,600 and you would get that number. So I'm just gonna leave it as is because we're going to need this in just a second. And we can start scrolling down here because I don't have much time, I have five minutes. So let's look through the things that we've done to see if they're right. So H1 is 2758, we have gotten that right. S1 was 5.732 or 432, we also got that right. Move along, it says that uh, X2 was 0.6745. I just said 0.675, so we are correct there. And it said that H2 was 1794.8. I've said 1795, so we are here as well. Good. And then H3 is equal to 173.88. We also got that right. And then we did the perfect pump rule, which is this equation right here. And right here is the uh, rest of it. So once, so what they did was they, they did it in megapascals, but then they had to multiply by 10 to the 6 to get it to end up. Multiply by 10 to the 6, divide by 10 to the 3rd to get this to work out. So essentially divide, multiply by 1,000, and you would get your answer to be 181.94, which is what we got as well. And then... Uh, what'd they do? Mass flow rate. Let me see what hours, if I multiply by 3,600, so times 3,600. Yeah, so uh, if you multiply what we got by 3,600, uh, I got 3. Point, yeah, 7, 7, uh times 10 to the 5th. So this is what it would be right here. So they are correct as well. Now let's go back really fast, now that I know that that's right. So... We need to hurry up and do the rest of it. So the first thing they want we to we want us to find is the heat in. So let's do the heat in, which is the QN of the cycle, which is the heat going into the boiler. So the heat going into the boiler is very simple. Uh, if you do an energy balance around it, you'll find that it makes no work, uh, which means that all that's left over is and there's no kinetic potential things like that. All you'll find is that H1 minus H4 times the mass flow rate is uh, equal to QN. And if you do this number out, which I will do in just a second, 2758 minus 181 times 104.72, you get the following, 269765, 
uh, at, and this is in uh, kill. This would be in kilowatts. So this right here is our number in uh, kilowatts. And if you wanted this in megawatts, obviously divide by a thousand, uh, and you would get two hundred sixty nine point seven six five kilowatts. So this is an answer. I'll circle them at the end, but that is an answer that we needed to find. Uh, the network, or we found the mass flow rate, we found that. Now we have to find the thermal efficiency. So the thermal efficiency is, like I said, equal to network over QN. And if we do that, we know the network is 100 megawatts, right? And we know the heat into the cycle, as I just showed you right here, is 269 uh, six, seven, or 765 kilowatts, but if you convert it to, obviously, megawatts, uh, you end up with what I said, which is 269.765. So 269.765. And if you divide these two out, 100 divided by second answer, you end up with a thermal efficiency of 0.37. So 37% is the answer to that. And now we have some other things we have to do really fast. Uh, one more, I think we have like one or two more things. So let me go back up. So we have thermal efficiency, mass flow of the steam, rate of heat transfer in. Now we need the rate of heat transfer out. So we do Q out. Q out is very similar to Q in. It's just the heat leaving in the condenser. So it is very simply H2 minus H3 times the mass flow rate. And if you do this out, uh, which is 1795 minus um, 173.88, and you multiply by 104.72, you get the answer in kilowatts, which would be 169763.82. And this would be in kilowatts right here. So that is our answer to that as well. And you can get this in megawatts as well, just as much, doesn't matter. And then one more is the back work ratio, since we don't really have time for the last part, but I'll explain it very quickly. So this is back work ratio, which is the work of the pump divided by the work of the turbine. So work of the pump divided by work of the turbine. So uh, what this equation boils down to is very simple. It is just H. Uh, you can do this per unit mass or you can do it without, because remember, since the mass flow rates are the same, they will cancel. So it doesn't, uh, but I'll write it out again. As I said, H4 minus H3 divided by M times H1 minus H2. And as you can see, the mass flow rates will cancel, so therefore you'll just be left with your enthalpy values. And your enthalpy values plugged into here, this should be a very, very small number. Uh, I don't know what it is exactly yet, because I'm typing it in, but it should be extremely small. 181.94 minus 173.88. Yeah, this is gonna be tiny. Uh, 2758 minus 1795.93. Yeah, uh, I got an answer of 0 0.0084. So essentially what it is saying is, is that um, the ratio of the amount of work the turbine makes, uh, or pump to turbine, uh, is 0 0.008. So this pump is very, very small compared to the amount of work that the turbine is making, which is good, this is what you want. If this, if this ratio is like, you know, 20 or like, you know, uh, 0.2, that means that 20% of the turbine work is going to the pump, which is not good. <laughs> we don't want that. We want a very small number. You want to minimize that. So that's good. It's a good answer. And then let's go back here to see if I, what I got. Yeah, so it's 0.84%, which is what I got, 8.37 times 10 to the negative 3. Uh, Q in, Q out, I've gotten all of these. And then there's one more that I'm just gonna very briefly uh, outline. So the last one is, 
It says the mass flow rate of, of the condensing cooling water in kilograms per hour if the cooling water enters at 15 degrees C and exits at 35. So essentially what they have just done here is they have, you know those questions we used to do? Uh, well, not used to really, we've done them fairly recently. They've just given you a heat exchanger question. They've done this right here. State, this would be state two, state three. And this would be state one and two of the cooling water. So one and two, which would be CW. Remember how I told you that the condenser is just hooked up to a lake somewhere, right? That is what they're doing here. This is what the condenser is doing. It's just a in-depth look of the heat of the heat transfer process. So essentially, you just need to find the mass flow rate of the cooling water, which if you do this just like we have done any other heat exchanging process, you will find the following equation. You will say that M, 1 times H2 minus H3. Yeah, sorry, I didn't print to see that. Minus H3 has to be equal to. Um, so you could. So here, here's two ways you could do this. They gave us the temperatures of these two. They gave us 15 degrees C and 35. You could do this by using uh, MCP delta T. So it could just be this. Uh, M... So this would be M of the water, by the way. So mass flow of the water times the CP of water times uh, delta T, which would be, 50, 30, or be uh, 35 minus 15. You could do this, or you could go look up in the tables and just go to the temperatures and find enthalpy values. And it's the same thing. You would just go to 15 and 35 and just pick up the saturated liquid enthalpy values because it's just liquid, it's cooling water. So you could do it that way as well. And then all you're trying to do is you're just maneuvering this equation to solve for this. It is, it is the same as we've done any other question involving a heat exchanging process. It just takes place around this right here. And as you can see, they even have an illustration of it. They show cooling water in and out and they have two and three going this way. So really fast, I'm gonna circle the answers and then we're going to go. Sorry for how long we've run over. So this right here is the mass flow rate in kilograms a second. Like I said, if you multiply by 3600, you will get it in the answer they want it to. Uh, QN, which is the heat going into the boiler. Oh man, I don't know what just happened there, my mouse pad. There you go. This is the heat going into the boiler. Uh, from it's the heat generated from the boiler. How about that? Where we're throwing in all of our fossil fuels or you know any nuclear reaction we have. This is where it's that is the heat being generated. And then we have the thermal efficiency, which is the efficiency of this cycle in terms of how much energy we are using or getting out as power versus how much we are throwing in. So I guess what you could say here is that 37 percent of the, the the heat we throw into cycles is coming out as power. Now you guys would say that's not very much, and I would agree with you, that's that's seemingly little, but uh, hard to do, hard to pull off. And then we go up here, Q out, this is the heat leaving in the uh, heat exchanging process uh, in the uh, condenser. And then the back work ratio, the ratio of the pump work to the turbine work is 0 0.0084. So essentially 0.8%. Uh, so these are all the answers. Now, really fast before we go and while I'm shutting down, uh, generally speaking, they won't ask you for all of these. They were just trying to introduce how the all, the, basically what you have just seen right here is a combination of many different questions. So generally speaking, they'll ask you for like one of these they'll be, or two of these. They'll go, all right, we need the thermal efficiency and the heat into the cycle. Or they'll say the thermal efficiency and the cooling water question, right? They'll give you one or two of these, never as many as they have here. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, shut down so we can take attendance and you guys can go. Uh, hopefully this made a little bit of sense. I know it's a lot though. This is what the whole next class is about.